Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to give me uh, the time to give some of my ideas on uh, user charging in, um, in transport. Um, it's about Australian roads, but there could be just as well New Zealand roads, because there's a lot of similarities between Australia and New Zealand. It's not just the humor and the pavlova, it's also the setup of the cities. So it's a very car-oriented city, Sydney is, Auckland is. Um, we have some tall roads, we have similar types of ways how we pay for transport. So everything that essentially holds for Australian roads, you could also translate into New Zealand roads. So the overview of the presentation is very briefly, what kind of road pricing uh, measures exist around the world, and specifically in Australia. Then I'm going to talk about strategies. How could we maybe reform the way we pay and going towards a pay per kilometer system? And that is by many deemed as a fair system. You pay for what you use. The introduction of it is not easy. How can we go from the current system with registration fees, fuel excise tax, and maybe some tolls to another system where we pay per kilometer? Um, how do you introduce this? Usually it involves changing the laws, changing the way we do things, but maybe we can do it in an easier way without having to do all the work all at once by, for example, putting all kinds of GPS devices in our cars and then uh, introduce it all in one go. Maybe we can do it in an easier way. So I talk about phase one to phase four, how we can do, use this uh, and do this in a probably much easier transition. And finally, I'll have some other consideration to, to think about. So first of all, some examples. We all know registration fees. It's a fixed fee um, that we pay for using the roads. Um, for some people, this is maybe a lot of money. Maybe they drive very little. For other people who drive a lot, it's a very cheap way to get around. Is that a fair system? Most of us know the fuel excise tax, also called gas tax in the US. You pay additional cents on top of your fuel price. Sometimes it's seen as for emissions to reduce emissions in other ways is for the general revenue. So the different countries uh, prices in different ways. Um, toll roads, they exist in many countries, but mainly in Sydney. I'll show you a picture later where you can see that Sydney is probably the number one in the world with regards to toll roads inside the city. And we pay actually a lot of money for them. Um, there's cordon charging in Stockholm, in Singapore, and in London. And you pay a certain price for entering the city center, a fixed price, um, essentially to reduce the congestion inside the city center. This works well if only there's congestion in your city center, but may not work well in cities where the congestion is much further widespread. Um, there's all kinds of other schemes, accessibility pricing. Um, you pay actually for having a faster travel time between cities in this case. So this is in the US where you have a parallel road, which is usually one is congested and the parallel roads, they ensure that it is uncongested. But a price goes up if it tends to become too busy. So you pay always for an uncongested trip towards the other city. Um, and by price, by price mechanism, they can guarantee it is not congested, but the price may be quite high if it becomes quite busy. For safety, there's pay as you drive. Several insurance companies around the world um, have introduced this. So you pay per kilometer. It may be more if you drive during the night time. It may also be more if you drive too fast over the speed limit. So they sometimes put a, um, a GPS device in your car. You can get discounts on your um, insurance fee, specifically the younger drivers, if you stay within the speed limit and if you don't drive during the night. Um, that has been introduced in several countries. What a lot of countries are interested in is a pay per kilometer charge, kilometer charging. You pay for what you use. Um, it was proposed a long time ago in the Netherlands. I'm originally from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, was proposed many years ago, but there they want to have a big bang. All the cars, all the means of cars in the country have to be um, equipped with a GPS device a quite um, complex GPS device, was expensive, it was very difficult to do logistics of, and in the end, the, the benefits or the revenues were not outweighing the costs, and it was no longer introduced, and the government abandoned the idea. 
kilometer charging have been introduced in Germany for trucks and recently also in Belgium. So there are GPS equipped trucks driving around in both countries and these countries are looking into can we also do something like that for car traffic. A unique system that was only in the Netherlands is peak avoidance. And this gives money to people. You could earn money a couple of euros per day if you avoided driving in a peak period. So this was cash that you could earn and save. Um, so I had a little piggy bank and it was seen as something for saving and for gaming. So people were trying to make the maximum out of it. How much could they earn? Hundreds of euros a year by not traveling during the peak period. Um, that it has been introduced in many cities around the country until the money ran out. <laughs> um, it, is, it no longer exists. But the idea behind this is quite attractive because you don't need to change any laws to pay people. But you may need to make some changes if you're charging people. And of course, paying is much more acceptable than charging. So can you come up maybe with a system that is sustainable over the long time um, that looks like this? That's more or less what this presentation is uh, about. I'm going to skip this slide. So there's multiple objectives why we want to do this. Of course, we need sufficient revenue to pay for all our roads, but also for public transport. Um, but we also may want to improve congestion, we want to improve safety, we want to have maintenance. All of these we want to improve, emissions as well. The top, what we want to do is, and what you actually do in New Zealand very well, is hypothecate the revenues to transport, which means all the revenues that are being collected have to be invested back into the transport system. Not just the roads, but also public transport. And that's probably a very good idea because it makes it more acceptable. If you put it in the general revenues and can be used for anything, that's usually considered less access acceptable. Regarding the impacts, if you want to improve any of these impacts, it needs to be some kind of user pay system. So the more you use it, the more kilometers you drive, the more you have to pay. Otherwise, there's no way you can improve these impacts. So the idea is how can we still collect enough revenues and maybe hypothecate it to transport, but also improve the other um, impacts. So reduce emissions, uh, reduce congestion. So how is it done in Australia? And I will compare it to a few countries uh, around the world. And I usually also include the Netherlands because that's what I'm most familiar with. And also Australia and, and also New Zealand in this case. So looking at the registration fees in North, New South Wales in Australia 2017, a light car, and this is all in Australian dollars, a light car $272 up to a heavy vehicle of $511. If you compare this to other countries, then Singapore sticks out. It's very, very expensive to drive a car in Singapore. Um, but if you compare it to um, New Zealand, New Zealand pays actually very, very little. It's probably still more than the US, but there's not many more, many countries in the Western world that, that pay less. So New Zealand is at the bottom of this scale. Now let's go to register, sorry, to uh, fuel excise tax. Where does New Zealand fit and where does Australia fit? This is, I'm not sure you can read it, but I'll give you um, indicators. On the left hand side is North America. So there is the US all the way at the bottom, Mexico and Canada. Very little fuel excise tax. On the right hand side, there is Europe. A lot of fuel excise tax. Here is Australia. Quite similar actually to North America. And there is New Zealand. Still at the bottom if you compare it with the whole range. So Australia and New Zealand do not really tax a lot. And in Australia, usually the motor motorist associations say, As car drivers already pay enough. We don't want to pay more. If you compare it with around the world, we actually don't pay much at all. We pay very little. Then the toll roads. This is a picture of Sydney. And the blue are the motorways. And these are toll roads. So essentially all the major roads are toll roads. And they're not just one or two dollars, they're actually very expensive. So if you have a one-way 
You pay a lot of dollars and you have to go back again in the evening from work, you pay again. <coughs> so these are significant revenues for the toll operators, which are mostly private operators. Um, and that's a significant cost to people in New South Wales. There's new toll roads being built. These are being added, uh, will be completed in the next coming years, mainly the West Connects. So the average charges, if you put the registration fee, the road tolls, and the fuel excise tax together, are about $1,200 Australian dollars a year. It's about $100 a month. This excludes parking fees, which are collected by the local government. If you compare it to other countries, um, New Zealand pays more in fuel excise tax, I showed you the figure, but pays less in registration fees and pays very little in road tolls. But the total is more or less the same. It's about, in Australian dollars, also $100 a month. So they're quite comparable with that respect. UK pays more, the Netherlands pays much more. Mind you that the income levels, for example, in the Netherlands are much lower than in Australia, and I'm not sure about New Zealand. Um, and also the tax levels of income in the Netherlands are much higher. So the people in the Netherlands pay a lot for transport, but can also probably say they have a better transport system. So $1,200 a year, can we not just pay it in a different way? So could we pay maybe per distance class? Because why would we want to do this? Well, look at how different people in Sydney would pay for the same distance. So I'm assuming here all, all drive an average amount of kilometers. This person lives in Sydney West, which is usually where the lower income people live. They have probably a cheaper car, so the registration fee is a little bit lower because it's a lighter car, but they have to use the toll roads a lot, so the blue area is quite large. Then a person living in the northern side of Sydney, they're usually higher income, um, but they may be, be able to afford a Tesla or another electrical vehicle. They pay no fuel excise tax at all, but do need to pay a lot of toll because they encounter a lot of uh, toll roads in the area. Then we have a person living quite far outside the city, north, also higher income, may have a heavy vehicle, some more registration fees, but don't pay any toll roads, uh, tolls because there is no toll roads in the neighborhood. And then finally, people living in the eastern suburbs, the wealthy area, um, they may have a heavy car, so more registration fees, but there's not many toll roads, so they may save there. So in the end, everybody pays a different amount but they all use the same amount of road space. So should we really be, 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 be uh, letting them pay different, or should we maybe have a more fair system where you pay per kilometer? So the current system I would deem is unfair, especially to people who drive very little. They have to pay the fixed registration fees, um, whereas the person who drives a lot pays exactly the same. The fuel excise tax, is especially expensive for people um, who have to drive far, but also who cannot afford to have a, a fuel efficient engine. So the older cars are less fuel efficient. They may be able, not be able to afford electric vehicle. And the other one is toll roads. Some of them, or mainly one, the ones in Sydney, are there because um, the government does not have enough money to, to fund them themselves. So they ask the private sector for money and they want to make a profit. And therefore the funding model is such that these toll roads came, came about. But if you happen to be living close to these toll roads, you pay a lot more than if you happen to live in an area where all the roads were for free. So is that a fair system? So what I also think is it's also untenable. We cannot have any revenues in the future anymore because the whole world is turning into electric vehicles and electric vehicles don't have fuel excise tax. And tax in electricity is really, really difficult to say you, you, you put electricity in your car. Electricity is electricity. So there is no alternative, I think, than a distance-based charge. Also, we think that in the future, many more people will travel longer distances because electricity is very cheap. So you can actually have your autonomous vehicle or non-autonomous vehicle, drive around for very little money. Um, they can pick up other people and maybe drive around empty to 
pick up another family man member or just drive around because you want to avoid paying parking fees because electricity is very cheap. You don't want this kind of situations to happen. So we want to charge the vehicles, especially the empty ones, a certain amount of money. We don't want to have too much empty kilometers being made. This is an article I found in the New Zealand Herald in 2016. Auckland road tolls, will drivers be forced to pay 40 cents per kilometer? I thought, wow, that's, very, that's a big um, step up. And then if you read the, the final letters, it's between 3 cents and 40 cents. Somewhere in that range. But it could be ab about right. Um, but also in New Zealand, it is likely to be um, in inevitable. So we really should be thinking about how do we do this best? So what strategies do we have? We have a stick strategy where you hit the donkey and you impose additional congestion charges, which is good for the government because you get additional money, but not very acceptable by the people, by the car drivers. You can also give the donkey a stick. Um, you provide discounts, for example, in the Netherlands scheme, where we gave money to people for avoiding the peak period but it leads to a decrease in revenue for the government, but it is highly acceptable by the drivers. So could we find something in between? So the proposed model is we need something with a stick and something of a carrot. So the proposed strategy is a distance time location based system, um, which we call a fair user pay system. So the more you use, the more you will pay. It offers incentives for saving money by driving less, driving off-peak or driving in areas where that is less busy, un uncongested. The system is proposed to be initially revenue neutral. So the government still gets the same amount of money, so which is acceptable by Treasury. And it would, as we'll show, decrease the cost for most people. So the majority of the drivers would find this acceptable. I'll show you a figure uh, with, with the evidence. Then the main question is, how can we transition to a user-based system? That has always been the, the limitation. We, how do we get there? What's the first step we need to make? Instead of just charging people, what you can do is make it a voluntary system. Everybody's happy with voluntary systems, where you provide, provide discounts using simple technology. And a single technology is important because if the technology becomes too expensive, that it may outweigh the revenues and the benefits of introducing it. <coughs> Once you have this in place and people trust it and get familiar with it, then you can further expand the system. And that's what the system is that I will propose. Um, also in Stockholm, initially when people were thinking about a court and charge, they didn't like it. Then the government said, let's do a trial. Let's just try it. If you like it, we keep it. If you don't like it, we get rid of it. They, they trialed it and the people liked it and they kept it. The same in London. Everybody was very much opposed against London congestion charging. They introduced it and in the end, the people in the city were actually happy and want to keep it. So when people feel that it is fair, feel that it is beneficial, <coughs> then they may be more tempted to keep it. So why not just try it, volunteer it, and see what happens? So the system is as follows, pay per kilometre. And how are we going to do this? So in step one, and I have here state, because in New South Wales or in Australia, the state collects the registration fees. Here it is national, but not, not in Australia. So we're first going to replace the registration fee with a distance-based fee. Then in the second step, I propose it's an optional step to replace the road tolls with a distance-based fee. And the third step, also the fuel excise tax, which is collected at a national level. And in the fourth stage, you also introduce, in addition, distance, time, and location variations. So what do these four steps look like? Let's, let's look at the first one. I did some calculations, and I put some numbers to it. So this is completely voluntary. People can voluntarily participate in a distance-based pricing scheme where it works as follows. 
I've translated the registration fees into a kilometer rate. So a light vehicle would pay two cents per kilometer up to 3.7 cents for a heavy vehicle. And that is based on the average driving of an Australian of 13,700 kilometers and the existing registration fees. And this would keep it revenue neutral. So if everybody kept driving in the same way and volunteer, Treasury would still get the same amount of revenue. Um, so how would we collect this? We would propose to just do odometer readings. Just read how many kilometers you've driven, which is fairly reliable. And not many people worry about electricity meters either. And has been tested in Oregon, the US. And what you pay is how much you have traveled, times your kilometer rate. If you drive exactly 13,700 kilometers, you pay exactly the same amount as you would pay in registration fees. But if you drive less, you can get a discount. If you drive more, you never pay more than a registration fee. So it is risk-free to participate. So you can only get discounts, you cannot pay more. Um, if you do not provide your odometer reading, so you have to then tell the government every year, this is my odometer reading, they may have to see it, maybe at your annual checkup of your car. If you do not provide the evidence, you just pay the registration fee, you get no discount. But if you do provide it, you may get the discount. So that's what this system is, voluntary, easy to introduce. You don't need any new technology. This is the graph with the evidence for that the majority of the people would benefit. If you look at the left-hand side, so these drivers here, these drivers drive very little. So it's the bottom percentage of the drivers which, who only drive very few kilometers a year, whereas there's only a few of them, 5%, the top 5%, who drive a lot. They're responsible for a lot of kilometers. But if you then look how many people drive less than average, so the average is 13,700 kilometers, 60% of the people drive less than average, which means that 60% of the people would get money back if it was a distance-based charging. So potentially, 60% of the people would participate in this experiment. Um, so how would this evolve over time? Well, the total revenues are exactly the same. This is the situation where we want to go towards. So the area under the curve indicates the amount of revenue collected by the government. And I've now replaced the number of kilometers driven with a dollar, because there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between kilometers and dollar. This area underneath is exactly the same as this area if there's a fixed registration fee. So it is completely revenue neutral. So let's try to introduce it. Let's see how the transition goes. We start here. This is the current status quo. It's a fixed registration fee. And now we introduce discounts for driving less. So if you drive less kilometers, you pay less. So if you drive zero kilometers, you pay zero. If you drive this amount of kilometers, you pay this fee. So let's suppose only a few people were participating, and it's likely going to be the people who can benefit the most. So these people would pay that amount of money. And the green part is the amount of discount they would collect. But that means that Treasury, the government, gets less money. So to compensate for that, they will have to increase the registration fee over time. So if nobody participates, the registration fee will not change. But if people do like it and participate, slowly the registration fee will go up. So to compensate for the discount given means the registration fee has to go up to here. But because now the registration fee is higher, more people would like to participate. So now maybe this many people want to participate. That means more discount given, more that the registration fee has to go up and up <laughs> until you reach a complete, fully distance-based scheme. If people don't want it, nothing will happen. So then we stay in this state. So if nobody likes it, we stay here. But if people do like it, they will go here by themselves. The government doesn't do anything. They just set the rules. And they say, we just want to have the same amount of revenue. And you tell me 
if this is going to happen or not. So if you think that people act rationally and are willing to save money, this is where it could go. But then the equity problem comes in. In Western Sydney, it's further away from the city, the jobs are in the city centre. The people with low income live further away from the jobs. So the problem is always that a high income driver from the eastern suburbs near the city in Sydney um, therefore pay less than the low income drivers that have to come from the western suburbs working in the Sydney CBD. So this is not good for the government because it's harder to sell the message. They are really charging the low income people harder. Could we come go around this? This is a quite difficult problem to solve. One of the ideas I have are borrowed from public transport services in Sydney. If you live close to the city centre, you pay a lot for your public transport ticket. So maybe three or four dollars for just one train stop. But if you want to drive for two hours on the train, it's ten dollars. So the further away you go, the less you pay per kilometre. And this is specifically done for the people who live far away from the city to give them at least opportunity to drive further. So that means that also the, the price difference between high income and low income people diminishes somewhat. You can also argue that people with a higher income have a heavier vehicle. And also a Tesla is a heavy vehicle, it's like 2,000 kilos. So these people would pay more. But if you want to avoid pay, paying more, you can opt for purchasing a lighter car, a cheaper and lighter car. So in this case, I can have that a high income driver pays more even for a shorter distance than a low income person driving a longer distance. So I think there are ways around the equity problem. We just have to be creative. Practical example, for the first 5,000 kilometers you pay 4 cents per kilometer, then 3.5, then 3, and then 2.5 cents per kilometer for all the kilometers exceeding 50,000. Just an example. And this is on an annual basis. You can also do this on a monthly basis. You can translate the scheme um, in such a way as well. So the technology you need is only an odometer, so no need for technology. But some people may find it a hassle to every year show evidence of their monthly or of their yearly kilometers driven. And for those people, there is the option to purchase or maybe get one for free by the government, whatever policy is in place, to have a very simple G GPS device that can just store kilometers. And those should not be more than $100. You buy them one time for the rest of, um, for the, rest of the, the years coming. Should be government approved, maybe there's an app in the Apple CarPlay or the Android Auto store. Um, there's no privacy issues for GPS devices because these GPS devices are so simple, they cannot store spatial temporal data. They only store amount of kilometers driven, only one number. There is no more memory in that GPS device than to store one number. Um, you can automatically then calculate monthly discounts, so, so these people don't have to show evidence every year. Every month they can already collect discounts. And that provides some kind of saving mechanism. People can log into a website, see how much they have saved. They can also have more game. So how, how, how do I compare with other people that turned out to be very successful in the Netherlands? So that's a saving and gaming element again. Um, but you don't need to do this. This is still optional if you don't want to uh, do it every year. Phase two, optional, is replace the road tolls with a shadow toll. In this case, the government pays or partially pays for the road toll. So the, gov so the car driver doesn't even know he's driving on a toll road. All the toll roads are then paid for by the government. Um, one by one, they're being counted and the government just pays. But of course, then the government, if the government pays, then the government wants to again charge it back to the car drivers as a whole network. And I did it for the calculation for Sydney. It's around one billion in revenue in New South Wales of toll roads. It's a very high number. <coughs> and if you divide it by the number of kilometers driven, it's 1.8 cents per kilometer. So now, in this case, not specific people living around the road tolls 
toll roads have to pay, but everybody else is contributing to these roads. Um, phase three is replace the fuel excise tax. In Australia, this is a federal um, tax. And this is not voluntary anymore. So if you have phase three, everybody has to participate. So hopefully in phase one and phase two, a lot of people are participating, trialing, and people see the benefits and are accepting for the registration fees. And now when you're at phase three, then the government has to impose, now we go national, now everybody has to participate. That does not mean that everybody has to put in a GPS device. We can still do odometer readings. So it's still an easy transition from the current status quo. If you convert the fuel excise tax into a distance-based charge, it's about four cents per kilometer. Um, the heavier, the more polluting the vehicles are, the more that you'll have to pay. So it's vehicle specific. So if you then look how we have translated this, the $1,200 per year is now translated with registration fee toll roads and fuel excise tax into nine cents per kilometer. So in New Zealand dollars, about 10 cents per kilometer. And remember that New Zealand pays more or less the same on an annual basis as Australia. So this is quite similar to what you would pay then in New Zealand. So that's phase three. Phase four is, and this is now where finally we can attack the congestion much more, is introduce time varying allocation fees. And if you do not do this, you will miss out on most of the congestion busting systems because the best choice that people have to avoid congestion is to depart earlier or later to work. Um, there's mode choice, there's route choice, but often there's no route alternative or not very attractive, and often maybe there's no public transport alternative. But many people have the option to depart earlier. If you do not have that option, well, other people will. So then you are faster at work because other people will go out the peak period and you are faster. So everybody can benefit from that. So here, this is a voluntary system because this is, again, a discounting system. If you do not participate in the time varying, but just in the national scheme with distance based, you just pay per kilometer the nine cents. But if you do participate in the time and location based system, you can get discounts for traveling off peak and discounts for traveling in quiet locations. Um, voluntary, so nobody's forced to put anything in their car. If you want to get the discount, you need to provide evidence. And the evidence is provided again by the optional GPS device you put in your car. What does that look like? This is what you now have in your car. You have an odometer which tells you exactly how many kilometers you drive. And if you show this evidence, you pay the nine cents per kilometer. But if you choose to invest in maybe the hundred dollar device, you get one that gives you two rates, a standard kilometer and a discounted kilometer rate or numbers. And then you can get a discount for the amount of kilometers you've driven in low cost areas or times. So this is off peak periods as quiet in quiet areas. It's very similar to day and night tariffs in electricity. And if you don't show the evidence, you assume that everything is a standard kilometer. So then you go, go here. This is again similar to public transport in New South Wales because public transport in New South Wales is more expensive during the peak periods, both morning and evening, and also is different across different parts of the city. So the morning peak is defined differently in certain areas of the city. Sometimes it starts earlier, sometimes it starts later. So it all depends on where does it get busy in the network at what time. This is the standard distance-based system. No time variations, um, no discount for uh, uh, quiet area. So you pay the same standard kilometer rate across the whole city and in a peak and off-peak period. But if you have a time-based system, then you pay the high rate in a peak and you pay the low rate in the off-peak. And if you have the most sophisticated system, it's exactly the same GPS device in your car, still very, very simple, then you pay the high rate in certain areas of the city that are busy, and you pay the low rate in other times and elsewhere. 
and all your device is doing in your car is, I have so many kilometers driven in the dark gray and so many kilometers in the light gray. And that's all that device is doing, just storing two numbers. Again, it's not tracking where you are, it is not storing where you've been, it only calculates two numbers, so there's no privacy issues. So we've gone now from the $1,200 per year to about nine cents, and if you have the standard kilometers, they need to be higher than nine cents per kilometer, and the low, big discounted rate is then less than nine cents per kilometer. The exact numbers depend on how many people get discount. If no one participates, then you have the same revenue, so then there's not much difference between the two maybe, but if a lot of people participate, you'd want to have the same amount of revenue to keep it revenue neutral. So if the government gives a lot of discounted kilometers, it means that the standard kilometer rate will slowly go up again, the same way as the registration fee went up, just to keep it revenue neutral. And if that happens, more people are happy to try to avoid and go in the discounted kilometer and maybe participate. So it's exactly the same gaming element in there. So the technology, if you want to participate, well, you cannot go again um, um, outside the GPS device, but this again is a very simple GPS device. It can only store two rates of kilometers, standard and discounted. It can be an integrated system, and exactly the same things as before. Um, and you have again the saving element and the gaming element. You can check online how well you've done and how much you have been driven, been driving in all the months. So some other considerations. I've not talked about paying more. I've only talked about paying differently, which is a very different message, which makes it much more acceptable for people. It sounds much fairer if you say, if you drive little, you pay very, very little. If you drive more, you pay more. The advantage is that it offers genuine possibilities to avoid paying the money. So you can change uh, by driving less. You can change to um, try drive at a different period and save money. Now currently there's no way you can save that by changing your departure time or by driving much less, only in fuel excise tax, but not in registration fees. The transition is always much easier because it's a voluntary participation system. You can start at any time you want. You can start small, so start maybe with a trial of a few hundred people or a few thousand. Why not give it a go and see how that would work? Other ones, hypothecation, I mentioned it in the beginning. If you want to get, get some credibility, all the revenues you collect, you preferably want to save and allocate to spending in transport. So road transport, road infrastructure, and public transport services, which are, by the way, also good for car drivers, because the more people take public transport, the more um, the empty roads will be. This is already in place in New Zealand. We don't have this yet in Australia. I hope we will get this as well. The marketing of this, how do we sell this? Because whenever you talk to the media, they will say pricing, congestion, charging, all sounds very, very negative. But what I'm offering here is discounts, saving on, on the money, a um, much fairer system. The support of motorist associations could be quite important. If the government conveys this message, people may not believe it or trust it. But if a motorist association is on board, they may be able to sell this message much better. That's at least what happened in the Netherlands, and the motorist association was on board, and they told their members that it was a good idea, and everybody was on board at that time. We also get what we pay for. So if you want more improvements in the system, because this is just still saying you have the same amount of revenues, and you can only spend a dollar one time. If you really want to make changes to the transport system, and New Zealand is not paying a lot, and Australia is not paying a lot. If you want to get more European style investments, then you have to pay more as well. So I'm not saying we should not pay more, but that's not what the system should be about initially. We just want to pay differently. But we have to think about what do we want the city to look like in the future, and maybe we should try to get more investments um, here in Australia and in New Zealand maybe as well. Um, just a few slides to, to finish. People will always have opposition to change. 
and there will always be winners or losers. So for example, picture in Amsterdam on the left, this was the shopping street on the left hand side in the early days, it was quite congested, a lot of traffic, very unpleasant to walk around. And in Australia they would say, well, we don't have space to make a bicycle lane. And then in Amsterdam they say, well, we have very narrow roads because we're a historic city, but we can still make bicycle lanes, we just make it one way. And this has been done throughout the city. They're making it more car uh, bicycle friendly and less car friendly. Yes, there are winners and losers, but overall this was really supported by a lot of people after it was put in place. If you would reverse the argument and would say we have this now and let's go back to this situation, a lot of people would oppose. It's the same with pricing. If you come with a distance-based charging scheme currently, you propose let's charge a fixed fee for everyone, a lot of people would oppose. So it's your reference point. The same here, a nice picture from 1910, on the left hand side, another shopping street in Amsterdam, only pedestrians, there were no cars yet, and a tram. Then progress, they got rid of the pedestrian area, making it for cars and the tram. Then more progress, they said, well, we cannot have cars in the city, we move it back to pedestrian only and tram. There's winners and losers, the, the shops here could argue, well, there's no parking space in front of our um, shop, so you get less people. Well, where would there be more people, here or here, right? So is that really an argument? So finally, who will introduce the distance-based pricing scheme first? And my bet is on New Zealand. <laughs> Thank you very much.